What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village. In the last episode, we... I guess... What did we do? We struggled a little bit with one of those puzzles. Um, the tile puzzle, to be specific. And I believe we had started a new chapter. We were on our way to chat with Zapone, who, according to Ingrid, was actually one of the Baron's close friends. So, I think that's where we were now. We had just interacted with the, the cat, and... Thank you, uh, Robo Pupper, for showing us where that hint coin is. That's actually really helpful, <clears throat> rather than having to click all over the place. <clears throat> Good afternoon, mister. Hey, I'll tell you a secret if you solve this puzzle for me. It's about a girl who's about to have her birthday. Alright, I mean, I guess that works for me. 60 Picarats? Oh man, here I was thinking, alright, I could start off the day with some early morning, early morning, late, and try something a little bit different. And they're like, start me right off the bat with a 60 picker at puzzle. All right, guys, let's give it a look. Let's give it a go. Um, when asked about her birthday, a young woman gives the following information. The day after tomorrow, I turned 22, but I was still 19 on New Year's Day last year. When is her birthday? When is her birthday? So on January 1st of last year, she was 19. But in two days, she turns 22. It makes me think her birthday actually has to be January 2nd. Yeah. Because it could technically be December 31st, and then last year would still technically be that. So let, let's think about this, right? Um, I guess it, it is currently the year 2020. Let's imagine it's December 31st on 2020, and your birthday is January 2nd. Last year on January 1st, if you are now 21, you would have already turned 21 this year, and you would have turned... 20 on January 2nd last year, so you would be 19 on January 1st, and in two days, it'll be January 22nd, um, and you'll turn 22. So yeah, I think it's January 2nd. You just have to play around with, uh, basically, in two days, you have to progress into the next year, and her birthday needs to be early enough in the year that she would then, uh, obviously, age. Um, but at the same time, it has to be after January 1st. And obviously that leaves only one date in mind, which is January 2nd. But I think that works. Again, presuming like today is December 31st, 2020, and she's 21. In two days, on January 2nd, she would turn 22. Let's go back a year. Um, on January 2nd of 2019, she would be 20. Which means on January 1st of 2019, she'd be 19. Yeah, I, I like that. So the month would be January. And then the day would be second. Yeah, let's give it a go. There we go. What an interesting puzzle. All right. So despite being 60 pick rats, that actually that actually came to me pretty quickly. Yeah, wow, um, that's really interesting. It was just kind of like thinking about the transitions and and I don't even know how to describe that process that was going on in my head that led me to that, but nevertheless, here we are and uh, surprisingly quickly made it through that 60 picker out puzzle. Wow, you're smart. Okay, come close so I can tell you my secret. I heard that all the people who get kidnapped feel a little sick right before they get taken. I bet the monster that lives up in the tower feeds its victims super gross food before it pounces. Oh, I bet it's like hamburger ice cream with butterscotch and mayonnaise swirl. That's gross. <laughs> That's so gross. Or maybe he just picks the weakest of the bunch to snatch. I just don't get why he needs all those people. That is very odd. But the way it sounds, um, or the way she describes it, makes it seem like it's 
there's like a poisoning going on. Now, let's see here. Obviously, Zapone is there, but we're gonna check the other sides of the of the fork so that we can talk to all the other people, discover all the puzzles before progressing the story. Because you guys know me over the past few episodes, especially I've been do trying my best to explore every nook and cranny so that we find everything the game has to offer. Obviously, we could always find them in Granny Riddleton Shack afterwards, but then we miss out on the unique dialogue and context for the puzzles. So this is probably this is my preferred way of going about it. Regardless, we have Giuseppe here who says, Oh, a customer. Welcome, welcome. I have some great deals on sausage today, and my skirt steak will make any plate a fashion plate. Sorry to disappoint you, sir, but we didn't come here to shop. Aw, oh, and here I was thinking I was going to reel in a big sale. You got a hungry look about you, you know? Well, if I can't interest you with any of my fine meat products, can I at least tempt you with a puzzle? Of course, of course. This is Professor Layton. Sausage Thief. 40 pigrats. Okay. Ah, another one of these. Let's let's hope we interpret the the statements correctly. Let's hope their meanings are clear. Somebody ate the butcher's sausages. Here's what these four boys have to say. A says B ate the sausages. B says D ate them all up. C says I didn't eat them, no way. D says B is totally lying. Only one of these rascals is telling the truth and all the others are needless to say lying. Can you figure out who ate the sausages? So, at first glance, A and B can't both be telling the truth, right? Um, if A is telling the, let, or I guess let's consider these situations, right? If A is telling the truth, then B, C, and D must be lying, right? <clears throat> B's statement, D ate them all up, would mean if that were a lie, would say D did not eat them. And again, that would be congruent with A being a truth teller, saying that B ate them. C being a liar would mean what? Um, I didn't eat them, no way. If C were lying, then C would be actually... That, that statement would actually imply that C ate them. And similarly, D, if B were lying, D's statement would be true. So it's not A that's telling the truth. So A is a liar. So B did not eat the sausages. Alright, let's consider if B is telling the truth. D ate them all up. Well, if we consider that, A would then be a liar, which is fitting, um, because A claims that B ate them all up. B is telling the truth and says D ate them all up, so that's okay. At first glance, D says B is totally lying. But if B is telling the truth, then and and D is then lying, um, that's actually congruent. But then C would be lying as well. And C says, I didn't eat them, no way. Which would mean C ate them. And if B is telling the truth, that would mean both C and D. But we know that one of these rascals is telling the truth. And the way the, the question is posed, it makes it seem like there's only one person who ate the sausages. So that can't be the case. We can't have both B and D, or both C and B eating them. So A and B are lying. So either C or D is telling the truth. Let's see here, C. I didn't eat them, no way. If C is telling the truth, C did not eat them. And all three of the other gentlemen are lying. Um, a is lying about B ate the sausages, which would mean B did not eat the sausages. B says D ate them all up, and if they were lying, D did not eat them all up, which would mean A would be the only person left. Let's see here. D though. B is totally lying. If that is a lie, that would mean B is telling the truth. But if C is telling the truth, B must be lying, so that cannot be the case. So, D must actually be telling the truth, and A, B, and C must be lies. So, if B is lying, it would mean D did not eat them, based on B's statement. It would mean B did not eat them, based on A's statement, and it would mean C ate them. So, C is the person who ate the sausages. D is telling the truth, and as a result, we know from A's statement, 
that B did not eat them, from B's statement that D did not eat them, and C is lying, who says, I did not eat them, no way, which would mean C ate them. Alright, I like that. I don't see any contradictions there. We'll give it a go and see how it works. Hope Luke for the best, right? My answer. All right. Every puzzle has an answer. Luckily, it seemed like in that case uh, there wasn't too much that was questionable questionable about how to interpret those statements, which was really nice. Okay. Hey, you're pretty good at this. As a bonus for solving my puzzle, I'll throw in some gossip I heard. Word is that somebody lives in that dark, grimy tower. You'd have to be one odd duck to want to live in that old, moldy wreck of a place. We got a flower vase. Oh, where do we give the flowers? I think we gave the flowers to Luke. Okay. So that was that was pretty neat. It's also pretty cool that as we solve more of these puzzles, just around the, the village, we get more of a glimpse into what the villagers think about... Um, about everything going on, because there's quite a bit going on. What do we have on the ground here? Professor, there's something on the ground here. You're right, it appears to be a scrap of paper. Will you check if anything's written on it? Sure thing. Let's see here. The boss complimented my latest model today. He's a good guy and he's given me a new sense of purpose. I'm sure this is my true calling. I want to perfect my skills so I can repay the man for his generosity. This sounds a great deal like a journal entry, doesn't it? Judging by how the writer uses the term, the boss, I imagine he was under the employ of the Baron. Yeah, that's the impression I was getting. I've constructed models to fit every situation, just like the boss asked me to do. I've got to smile when I see how interested he is in them. Okay, so it sounds like the Baron hired this person to create a model of his, uh, his late wife, Violet and thus produced Lady Dahlia, and this person is now creating models of other humans in the village who are maybe replacing the real people, and so there are a bunch of machines running around in St. Mystere, maybe? I don't know. That's the end of the entry. Do you suppose this person made some sort of models for a living? Hmm. Very perplexing. Alright. Gerard, if you're looking for Zapone, you can finally find him loafing about the fork in the road. Ah, uh, thank you. Prosciutto, do you have anything for us? <clears throat> Yo, Professor, did you find what you were after? Never mind that, though. I've got something more important to talk about. Namely, chocolate. Okay. Help me solve this puzzle, and I'll tell you something I bet you'll find very interesting. Ooh, that's... That's quite the, uh... That's quite the lead there. Chocolate puzzle. You have a hankering for chocolate, so you buy a huge sheet of 30 chocolate squares. Okay. Um, the sheet is five squares long by six squares wide. You can only break the chocolate at the lines that run between squares, and you aren't allowed to stack multiple segments on top of each other. Keeping those rules in mind, what is the fewest number of times you'll need to break the chocolate in order to separate each of the 30 chocolate squares? Interesting. And you're not allowed to stack multiple segments. Can I draw? I can. Lovely. So... Hmm. What is the most efficient way to do this? Can't say I've ever really thought about it much. What's even a really good way to think about it, you know? I'm trying to think in terms of, you want to be efficient with your breaks, right? And so eventually we'll need to break along every individual square, or rectangle, right? We'll need to eventually do that, and we could do that, if we wanted to, per se, break off one column and then break each individual row, right? Uh, that would be excessive, um, and that would be the least efficient way to do it. So how can we make it more efficient by breaking multiple of these, I guess, one segment long segments is possible. So 
I think a good way to start would be going down the middle this way. We want to break it into segments while preserving the ability to, to break future parts with efficient um, lines as well that would cover across multiple segments. So if we were to do something like that, then what could we do? Then we could break it, I guess, like so. That would be a second break. Then, hmm, let's just think about this little six tile square here in the corner. So if I have this six tile or rectangle, um, I could break this one and then two, three, four, five. Or I could do something where it's like one, two, three, four, five, but it doesn't matter actually. That segment, breaking it down in that segment will always lead to, to five. And now let's look at a, a three by three segment or rectangle in this um, top right area. It would be pretty similar where I could go one, and then two, but then I would need three, four, five, six, seven, and eight to break that up. Or rather than go horizontally, I could go vertically, but I, but that will lead me to the same thing. So it seems like these shapes lend themselves to the necessary number of breaks, right? So if I were to split this up into two two by three rectangles and two three by three rectangles as I have here um, well what could I expect I would need to use two breaks in order to break them up into the four segments but then the four segments themselves would involve five and five and then eight and eight and where does that lead me that puts me at 28 breaks which I guess is already better than the least efficient, <laughs> the least efficient method, right? Would be um, if we were to go one, two, three, four, five, and then for each of those do five, right? And it would be one, two, three, four, five, six times five plus five, 35. So we're already at 28. But is there a way to make that more efficient even, even so? And again, we can't stack segments. I guess something I'm curious about in terms of just the rules, once a segment is broken off, can you not hold it slash align it with other segments? Not stack on top of, but let's say I've broken the segments as shown on the diagram now with the lines I've drawn. Could I then hold this entire segment here together like this so that I could then break along this line? As in hold this top highlighted section next to this bottom highlighted section so that I could use one break on both of those segments even though I've already I guess disjointed that top segment from the rest of the bar. I don't know. I think, um, and it, that has a really profound impact on how many, how many folds or breaks I'll need. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, our 28 from before was assuming we could not do that. I can't otherwise think of a much better way to go about it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, I could try to split it up into like thirds. First, do something like that. 
but at that point it's looking pretty similar to the other way the the least efficient way um Yeah, because it would be nice to be able to, I guess, like, break it like that. Although, I guess, what am I saying? If, um, if we could align the squares after breaking them off slash disjointing them from the rest of the chocolate squares, all we would need is just the number of lines in the grid, right? Because we could just keep them in place and we go one, two, three four, and then one, two, three, four, five, like that. So, and then it would just be nine, um, which I, I think is too simple for their purposes. That said, this is a 30 pick -a puzzle. Hmm. So I don't know. Um, 28 seems pretty compelling, but I'm not convinced that that's the fewest way, you know? That's the fewest number of breaks. But I can't think of a much more efficient way to go about it. Yeah, I don't know if I can think of much better. I'm tempted to just try 28. I'm obviously afraid to get it wrong. But I can't think of a whole lot better of a way to go about it, really. You know? Like if I were to do, I mean, this is essentially what I'd wanted to do, right? It would be one, and then two, and then three, and then after the three, oh, it should actually be three instead of two. Um, and then we have the two two by three segments, and then we have the two three by three segments. The three by threes are worth eight, and the two by threes are worth five. And if that's the case, we're left with 29 actually, not 28. But I can't think of how to divide this up in a more efficient way, right? I could try to go off-center, but I don't think that will actually be all that helpful. So again, one, two, three. And then in our little four by four, that would require three. Right, or our two by two, our, our set of four, that would require three. I guess one thing I can do is block off areas and measure how many breaks I need in order to break up those blocks and see which is efficient. So for a two by two, I have four and that requires three. But in a two by three, I have six and that requires what, five. In a three by three, I have nine and that requires eight. So it's always just one less or one fewer than the number of blocks inside it. However, it requires more strokes, strokes, and like like I'm drawing um, breaks in order to break the the larger block into the smaller blocks, right? So I could look at this, um, for example, we have one two by three shown, right? A six block that's going to require five strokes. Strokes. Why do I keep saying that? Um, we already started with three, but then we have the the four or the three more from the two by two, and then if we were to look at the the two by four segment, right? What's the best way to go about this? Is probably this one, and then we'd have three on top and then three on bottom. So that would be seven, unsurprisingly, um, for an eight uh, segment block, right? And then down below we have four by three, which I'm gonna guess is an 11. <laughs> um, 
just because of the, the pattern and everything. And if we add up all of those together, what do we get? We get 29 again. So I think, I think so long as we break it up like this, that'll be our most efficient way. I'm gonna try that for now. And we'll see how it goes. I'm not 100% convinced that, should do it. that there isn't a more clever way to do it, but I guess that is Critical the case. Thinking is the key to success. I feel like that would be a pretty cool math problem to try to prove that you can't get fewer than 29 breaks. That would be um, that would be pretty neat. And I think the one area this puzzle could have been improved would have been to say um, specifically that you can't align segments for a break afterwards, right? Like by holding two separate pieces in your hand and then breaking them accordingly along lines. Regardless, now it makes sense. Okay, now about that hot info I promised. If you want to experience the best dining in St. Mystere, you've got to check out Crouton's Restaurant. Everything he makes is yummy. Don't even get me started on the stews. You have to try it yourself. Huh, the stews. Okay. I can, uh... I'll give it a try sometime. I mean, every time we go to Croutons, we just end up helping him mix stuff together because his measuring cups are out of hand. <laughs> um, I tried to click on what was on his table, but... Crouton makes chow that's out of this world. I could eat his place every day and not get sick of it. Okay, so we don't have anything new to experience from him. Um, anything else of interest in here? That chest in the background? Wrench on the ground? He's gotta clean up his room. It's pretty, pretty messy in there. Okay, and now we have found... Well, there is Zapone, but I want to go inside the bar first and see if there's anything of interest in here. Oh, I thank you for, uh... Um, showing us where that coin is. Is there anything of interest in here? Doesn't seem like it. Wow, much to my surprise. Cafe must not be very lively during the day, is it? <laughs> Alright, now we can finally chat with Zapone. Close friends of the Baron. It's true. I had the pleasure of meeting Baron Reinhold a few times. Mr. Zapone, you didn't happen to be good friends with the Baron, did you? Me? <laughs> oh no, I was nothing of the sort. Can you think of anyone at all who was close to Baron Reinhold? No, I didn't really know him. Well, there was that one possibility. No, wait, never mind. I'm not sure. Hmm? I guess Zepone can't really tell us much of anything, assuming he's telling the truth and doesn't have any ulterior motive to hide his friendship with the Baron. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid he was no help at all. I suppose that means we're back where we started, but at least we can be sure that this close friend we're after is a resident of St. Mysteer. We mustn't give up, Luke. Let's continue to ask around. Alright. Then, uh, ask around we will. Anything up here? Yep. Thank you, Robo Pupper. So, where do we want to ask around is the question. I guess we can talk to all the people. At this point, we've gone through all the puzzles. You sure I can't interest you in a nice cut of veal? It's a veal deal! <laughs> Appreciate the pun. And again, we're probably not going to find anything over here. We've already talked to Prosciutto a couple times. Um, we could talk to Gerard again, I guess. <laughs> um, not being a member of High Society myself, I've never so much as had a conversation with Baron Reinhold. Now, Sonny, much as I'd like to keep chatting, I'm awfully tired. I think I need to go lie down. Are you feeling unwell, sir? I'm just plumb exhausted lately. It's that awful noise coming from the tower, you see. It's gotten so loud I can't sleep a wink at night. Do you know what's causing the noise? It's just a rumor, but I hear that every time that sound rips through the St. Mysterious, someone disappears. They say the ones who go missing are people who've been talking about feeling tired. Those who disappear are back before you know it, so it's probably just a load of poppycock. Whenever the noise sounds, someone disappears. Interesting. Do you think the peculiar sound has anything to do with that strange old man who abducted Raymond? Hmm, not at all. It's certainly a possibility, isn't it? But why would he release his victims after going through the trouble of kidnapping them? Yeah, that's very odd. And, I mean, the thing is, I suspect that this person who's doing the kidnapping is trying to do something good and just not doing it the right way. Um, good intentions that manifest poorly. Hey, mister, it's good to see you again. See, I'm totally stuck here, and I could really use your help. My friend told me this puzzle the other day, and I just can't solve the thing. Can you help me? Oh, so she has another puzzle for us. Interesting. Oh, and it's based on more chocolate. <laughs> the chocolate code. Okay. 
On Valentine's Day, your gadget-loving, technophile girlfriend gave you a most unusual slab of chocolate. While the jumble of letters looks like nonsense, if you manage to decode the letters written on the chocolate, a message from your sweetheart will appear. What is she trying to tell you? Does each of the letters represent a word? Y would be you, right? But... Could C be chocolate? You... Mm, no... Um... I don't know. Um, is it like they're shifted? One or two letters in one direction? Mm, I mean... Just thinking about the first couple letters, right? So G and E, A, B, C, D, E, and F. So D and F would be on both sides of E, and then um, F and H would be on both sides of G. So if you were to do like one letter before, right, it would be D and then F, which I don't think is very reasonable. And then if... Hmm... If you were to do one after, I mean, that's not going to be very helpful either. Um, it would be H and then F. Oh, and the other, the other I should have said would have been F and then D, not D and F. Hmm. Maybe they mentioned technophile. They mentioned that she's a technophile. And they show her in the picture using a a pad of some sort to maybe print on this. So what do they want? What is she trying to tell you? Presumably some seven... Seven letter phrase or seven letter word? And it's for Valentine's Day? Right? Yeah, guys, I don't... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think, like, on a keyboard, what letters are in the vicinity of each of these letters, and trying to string them together, maybe, into one word. But even that's not really, like... Like, I guess where my thought process was is like, what's immediately around G? There's T, Y, H, B, V, and F. That's a lot of letters. When you look at E, it's W, S, D, R. Notably, there are no vowels. Why is that relevant? Well, when you look at C, it's surrounded by X, D, F, and V. And there are no vowels there either. And so, if you're going to string together a word, um, I mean, you can only have so many consonants in a row. And, and none of those first three letters have vowels surrounding them. So, is it that some of the letters are like, I guess, correctly placed, and the other ones are, are based on letters around them? Because otherwise, I don't... I don't know. And even then, if you consider that, like, oh, something like G has six letters around it, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of possibilities to consider when connecting with maybe E, maybe W, maybe S, maybe D, maybe R, which may be co connecting with X, D, F, and V. Um, and then there's the question of, is this building a word, or is it building the first letter of a seven-word phrase? I don't know. Um, the other thing is, there's an empty chocolate tab, right? One of them doesn't have a letter on it. What does that mean?
Is there supposed to be one? Let me see, actually, let's do this. There are two words that they want us to input for the answer. So... So... This is either a two-word phrase, or this, this is a two-word phrase. Meaning, each of those letters on the chocolate tablets is probably just a letter and not actually representing a word. So let's look at the last two letters and see what they could represent, right? We have N and W. N and W. Hmm. What, what could even, would even make sense to say on Valentine's Day? That's a two word phrase that has four letters and then, and then two letters, right? Just like what they have written there aside. What even makes sense on Valentine's Day? That's four letters and two letters. The only thing I can think of, I'm trying to go, I'm like cycling through two letter words, right? <laughs> like on, in, at, so, of, etc. The only thing I can think of is the word me. And when I look at that, M is one of the letters surrounding N, and E is one of the letters surrounding W. So maybe that is what they want me to do, but there are so many possibilities there that it seems unreasonable. But that's the only thing I can think of. Something me. So what four letter word um, would make sense? What comes to mind first is the word love. <laughs> Just like sending a chocolate that says love me on it. Um, but that doesn't fit the rule that we were just talking about, right? In G's vicinity, it's T, Y, H, B, V, and F. Maybe it's, maybe it's bite me? Is that what it is? No, I is not around E. <laughs> um, is it notice me, senpai? <laughs> I don't know, but I think, so we've got to come up with a four letter word that would go together with the word me, probably. And it uses letters within the vicinity of the letter written and possibly even the letter itself? I don't know. Um, help me? Is that what it is? Is that what it is? Let's see, G, okay, H is surrounding it. There's E, which we could presume is uh, one of the, the letters. I guess it's not something in the vicinity. It could also be itself. Um, what about C? C does not have L around it. Ah, oh, man, I got my hopes up. <laughs> um, so I guess we could consider what are the letters that have less uh, or fewer options, right? So C and Y are towards the edges of the keyboard, meaning, and same with E actually. Um, so C has like X, D, F, and V around it. Can't imagine X being used in this case. Same with V. As the third letter in a four letter word. And like the other thing is, the only vowel, <laughs> the only vowel in this entire phrase, or in this entire word, right? It would not be with G. It, it would have to be E as the second letter if we bend our rule to allow E or basically like the letter itself, rather than just letters surrounding what's given on the chocolate tab. Because C doesn't have any vowels around it, and then Y only has U around it. So, so what four letter word has three consonants and then a U, right? <laughs> Nothing that I can think of. Nothing that I can think of.
I guess, like, because this person is a technophile, maybe we're supposed to include internet lingo? But I don't think STFU would make sense in this context. <laughs> um, so I think in, in terms of just the... the vowels that would be necessary to make a four-letter word, given our only options are E is the second letter or U is the last letter, I think we need to have E as the second letter. So I'm thinking, so we have one four letter word and then a two letter word, and presumably that two letter word is me. That's what I'm thinking it is. It theoretically could be something else that's not coming to mind, but, but let's try and think of a four letter word that has E as the second letter and then uses those letters in the vicinity or including the letters themselves, I guess. Um, is it like tech me? So like G would has T around it? And Y has H around it? Tech me? I don't think that would make sense. So if I were to fix the third letter and make it X, Oh, is that it? I was trying to think what what letters could I make, right? Would it be like F E X V E X B E X H E X Y E X T E X? And I think I think that's might that might be the solution. G has T surrounding it, so you could have T E X. And then I was like, what also surrounds Y? It could be T. It could be text me. And that's the only thing that I think makes some sense. Text me. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm gonna go with that because if that's not it, I, I don't know. I don't know, guys. So we'll go with text me. That, like, makes sense in the context of this is somebody's valentine thing. Really? You're gonna give me a hard time with making the E again? Okay. Text me. Let's give it a go. Luke, here's that my was... Answer. Wow. That one was Original really, the key and I mean success. really roundabout, in my opinion. Your girlfriend's messages text me. The bites taken out of the chocolate show you how each letter written on the chocolate relates to letters on a keyboard. What? We were supposed to pay attention to the, the bites taken out? What? That was supposed to be a clue? Wow. I mean, I guess it makes sense, but I was not... That wasn't even, like, within my realm of considering possibilities. The only thing that I was thinking of was just proximity on a keyboard because she was a technophile, and they show her presumably working with a keyboard in the picture. Wow, that was, um... That was a tough one. That was a tough one. But regardless... Oh, is that all you had to do to figure it out? Why didn't I think of that? Can you keep a secret? Don't tell Aunt Adria you told me the answer, okay? Thanks, mister. <laughs> okay, um, I guess we'll, we'll continue onward then. Chat with Deke again, see if he has anything to say. Nothing good can be said about that tower. I heard it's all sorts of scary. You should stay away, yep. Okay, fair enough. Anything more over this way? I know we've already chatted with these people to solve their puzzles, but but do they have any more scoop on what's going on in the town? Where's the fun in running around uh, town trying to help other people? Don't you feel so dumb? Wow. Well, well, it's not like I need to help you then. <laughs> Whew, raid sure works up a mean appetite. I'm starving. Okay. Um, that one person mentioned stopping by Crouton, so... Let's see if Crouton has anything for us. Am I glad to see you, Professor? I seem to have gotten myself into another jam. I know you're busy and all, but I just can't find the answer to this puzzle. 
Could you give me a hand with it? Of course we can. Of course. Apples to oranges. Another 40 pick rat puzzle. Okay, so they're starting to get starting to get a little bit more difficult now. Um, some careless delivery man loaded two shipments of fruit into the wrong warehouses. As you can see in the picture below, the oranges are currently in the apple warehouse and vice versa. Can you correct the mistake and put all the fruit in its proper place? Um... Oh! I see, and so each of these is considered a move. So we need to switch the two, right? Um, and obviously we need to rotate what's available. So, if I were to take this... Like so... What I could then do is bring that over there, and then I can bring the apple over and then kind of rotate all of these up. This is probably not the most efficient way, now that I think about it. But it could work. Um, something worth noting is I can have one of these in transition at any given time. So I can kind of repeat this process, right? You've now seen I have one of the apples in transition and I have one of the oranges in transition. Um, what I could do now is um, I need to take out another one of well, the other, I guess. Right? Ooh, this is looking a little bit more complex than I'd originally anticipated. So I'm gonna need to do that in order to open up that pathway. And again, what I could do is bring this one up and over here and then slide this one in, and then shift them over again, like so. Honestly, I could repeat this process over and over, couldn't I? Right? Where now I bring a, uh, an apple over and then bring the orange in, and rotate around. Again, given my, my move number is getting that high, I don't think this is necessarily the correct way to go about it, but um, but I do think it's a step in the right direction. Because then I could, again, move the orange over here, and then bring the apple in. And uh, what we could do is rotate like so. And then we can bring this back up to bring one of these guys across. So we can bring the orange in. And then we can bring this guy up. So we can bring this guy across. Bring this guy in and up. And then we bring this like that, this across, this like that, we rotate this around. And then we bring this up so this guy can go across. This guy goes over here and down. Then we bring this guy up, and this guy goes over, and then we do this. Now, I imagine my moves weren't Luke, here's my the most efficient there, um, just in terms of the cycling and everything. Puzzle I, you'll notice that my movements got a little bit cleaner towards the end there. But regardless, oh, they don't even tell me how few movements I could do that in. That was pretty interesting. Ah, so that's how it's done. Thanks again, Professor. That was That was a pretty cool one. <clears throat> that was a pretty neat puzzle. I like that. Are we going to get any inside scoop or no? I guess not. <laughs> um, back for another match, eh? I just knew that the two of you were a bunch of chess fanatics. Nevertheless, this next one won't be easy even for a pair of chess fiends like you. 
Ooh, another chess puzzle. Okay, too many queens, too. And another 40 Picaret puzzle. Wow, so we are really, really uh, working our way up the Picarets. In chess, the queen can move the full length, yada yada. See if you can place five queens on this 5x5 five five chessboard. There's a catch, though. You must arrange the pieces so that no queen blocks another's line of movement. So if I had to guess, I would expect it to be a similar arrangement to before, where they're going to be like this, and then we just need to determine where the one in the middle would go. At first glance, does this work? We're gonna look at this guy up here. Nobody is in its line of sight. How about this guy here? Nobody is currently in its line of sight. This guy is also in nobody's line of sight, and this guy is in nobody's line of sight, and this guy is in nobody's line of sight. I think we did it. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> Again, um, just kind of using the, the pattern from the very first Queen's problem to expect where the likely solution was going to be. But um, regardless, there's more than one answer for this puzzle. Ooh, that's actually pretty neat. But wowzers, it looks like I'm going to have to think of a harder puzzle if I want to stump you. Can't wait for you two to see my next puzzle. Ooh, I'm, I'm excited too. Can we get it right now? <laughs> too many Queens 3? It's about time you two showed up, so you are ready for a little chess? Of course, of course. It's interesting that, um, 60 picarets? Wow. Um, so right away we could unlock another puzzle. I've always been under the assumption it's like, oh, each person has one puzzle and then you move on. But it seems even just talking to the same person multiple times in a row, you can get multiple puzzles. All right, in chess the queen can move the full yada yada. Let's try something a little different this time. See if you can arrange three queens on this 5x5 five five chessboard so that no more pieces can be placed on the board. Make sure you place the pieces so that no queen blocks another's line of movement. So we want to basically take up all of the different spaces on the board. And again, they can't block each other's lines of movement. Um, I think to get the most mileage out of them, we would want them to be in the center, um, or close to the center, so that they can take advantage of their um, excessive lines of visibility. And I think at first glance, this covers most of it. I think the only other thing we need to do is put one in the corner. And I think with that, we actually have it all covered. <laughs> um, just looking at this lower right one, right? We have this far right column, we have the bottom row, and then we have this um, left great, uh, I guess, brown diagonal. With this, we cover the second column, and we cover yeah, I guess let's go piece by, let's go like tile by tile. So the whole bottom row is covered. Let's go with the second row. The first three on the tile on the left are covered by that queen. The second from the right is covered by one of the queen, or well, no, the, the bottom queen covers the two on the right, so that's covered. The third row is completely covered by that queen on the left. The fourth row is completely covered by the queen in the top right. And then the top row is covered by all three of the queens, actually. The the bottom right queen gets the top left corner. The top left uh, white tile is covered by the left queen. And then the top right queen covers the final remaining three. So, yeah, and they're not hitting each other, are they? No. Luke, here's my answer. All right. <laughs> I don't know Wait, why, but I guess these, uh, these queen puzzles come to me pretty quickly. <laughs> Some people probably stumbled across the answer to this puzzle while they were working through the 5x5 chess problem. Yep, that's the answer, all right. But just wait for the gem I'll have ready for you next time. It's going to be so hard, it'll knock your socks right off. Ooh, I'm, I'm excited. Layton is definitely the one who could use the hat rack. I wonder if we could get that next Queen's puzzle if we just talk to Flicker right now. I don't know, but I, I'm curious. I'm excited. I, I like those puzzles, and for some reason they seem a little bit more intuitive to me. But... Nevertheless, I think we're going to call it here and say that in the next episode, we'll continue asking around town, seeing if anybody has more information on Friends of the Baron, um, see if we can maybe go into the park for the first time, and we'll stop by the inn, we'll stop by all these different places, and hopefully have even more puzzles to solve. Um, overall, they were pretty fun in this episode. Um, they're 
are always hiccups here and there, but uh, overall I, I enjoyed this quite a bit and I hope you guys did too. Unfortunately, Zapone didn't seem to be as useful as we'd anticipated, so we didn't get too many plot advancements, but the mysteries are certainly uh, building and we're starting to get a little bit more insight into it. We did find that journal page, right, that confirms more or less that somebody was building models for the Baron. And in the context of his sadness about his wife, the statue, um, the people, the loud no noises, etc., um, it definitely is starting to put some of the puzzle pieces together. But, anyways, until the next episode, this Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.